Hello, one and all, and welcome again to the uh, Snap No Tap podcast. Of course, I'm Tony Cicchini. I think we know that. You know, we have the one of the, the greatest human beings that that ever lived, Joe Cardinal. We have a special guest on today that I'll have Joe uh, introduce. Um, but I think we need to kick off this podcast with some sad news, some bad news. Uh, our dear friend, student, friend, uh, peer, Joe uh, Jason Bender, uh, his father passed away uh, Friday night. Um, as you guys may know that have seen my latest video release, we filmed it at Jason's gym and Jason appeared on several sections of the video. Uh, you know, it's just a uh, sad, sad situation. So um, my condolences to Jason and his family and uh, just thought I'd pass that information along to to those of you, uh, Joe Cardinal probably knows he has some Facebook page. I'm, I'm not on Facebook, so I don't, I just texted him, you know, so, um, obviously I'm not going to give out his personal phone number, but pretty sad news, right, Joe? Very much so, you know, and obviously, you know, Jason's been a good friend and supporter of he, ours. A guest. Um, He's been a guest on the, sh on the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, um, yeah, of course my heart goes out to him and I, I mean, uh, been in contact with him, of course. Uh, he, I, I, fortunately, he was able to be there at the end with his dad for you know, which means something, I think. And, um, you know, I think what's been heartening for me to see is how the community has stepped up to, to be there for Jason and support him. He has a gym, you know, we often plug his gym here on the show, uh, up in Andersonville, Bender's Martial Arts and Fitness. And I'm just seeing the you know, his other students and uh, you know, other instructors who are friends with his step in and fill in you know when he's he's got to take care of family and take care of the situation and just seeing all the love that they're giving towards him and support um you know just as kind of a reminder to me that you know uh you know training for martial arts and training in general or whatever your pursuit is one of the things is, is the community that you can build you know that the people the human connections you can get because when life when something like this happens, uh, you know, uh, if you've played your card rights and, and hooked up with the right people, they can be there for you. And so I'm really just, I guess, I'm sad for him, but I'm also happy that he has all those people who love him uh, and are there for him uh, and trying to do what they can. So, um, you know, that that's kind of the silver lining there. But yeah, our, you know, all our thoughts and prayers go out to Jason, of course, and anything we can do for him, you know. Uh, so, but yeah, it's definitely sad news. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, you know, but I do want to kind of introduce our guest, uh, Joe Lau. Uh, thanks, Joe, for making the time for coming out. Um, I guess I can explain how I met Joe. So um, last August, I did, uh, we did a podcast after I got back from doing two weeks at uh, Tom Brown Tracker School with my friend Dwayne. We talked about that. And there was just a ton of great instructors there, you know, on a, on a range of topics. Everybody seemed to have their own little specialty. So everybody kind of thinks about this kind of uh, this major figure, Tom. But what's to me so impressive is he has this cadre of instructors who specialize in different things and, and how, you know, kind of back to my comment earlier about uh, community, how there's this, uh, you know, multi-generational community built around uh, Tom's school and the level of expertise uh, uh, in, in different areas. And so th the way the class was broken down, there was two weeks and there was a break in between, uh, you know, because sometimes some people, you know, can't go for the full two weeks and so come back. And so uh, there was this gap, this, uh, you know, from Saturday when everybody leaves and then Sunday when class starts back up again. And that's when I got to meet Joe and Joe just showed up uh, and 
it was it was actually a very special time you know i'm so glad that i did the two weeks because there was this little interlude between this nice quiet interlude where a few of us were hanging back kind of practicing our skills and then people kind of you know people aff affiliated with the school people like joe just kind of come in and, and check in and hang out and see how our thing's doing and you know kind of out of nowhere i see i see this guy working this weird contraption making a fire with it i'd never you know we so they teach you kind of the what i would say that kind of entry level and not that they're entry level they're high level skills but like the first very fundamental i guess is the right word skills for fire making which is the bow drill and the hand drill and that's something that you know everybody should have in their skill set or work towards i just think it's you know one of those uh things that you know I, I try and work on at least once a week it's just one of those skills but anyways he's working on what i believe and you can correct me if i'm wrong is an egyptian um uh drill that's correct uh, okay wow i'm glad i was, and i was like gosh that, that, that's what it was called um working on it fascinating thing I, it's hard to describe uh, verbally without seeing a picture of it and just struck up a conversation and all of a sudden we we're just talking about fire making and it kind of joe just kind of took us into the classroom and and whiteboarded and gave us basically like a um you know like a mini seminar you know uh, just just freely shared what i think has kind of been one of his life pursuits and uh laid all this knowledge about friction fire and, and primitive fire making and this whole world out there and and kind of to my point which it's fascinating is that like what i've what i've seen and joey maybe even comment on that later is that mm. it seems that when people come to the school they get a, a kind of a, a spectrum of skills but then mm -hmm. certain people take the specific aspects of it so you know there's people who do like uh the primitive cooking might be a thing that just like that that gets their you know or maybe it's foraging and they just delve deep into it because all these you know this like i said it's a wide spectrum of skills you get at this school but each one you can kind of do it at a surface level or you know like kind of the, get the fundamentals but then if you want to you can dive deep and you know clearly joe uh once we hear him talking explaining friction fire and his passion for it, i can't wait to hear his story basically how that you know, became his thing. And really, I mean, once we get it talking, you'll be really impressed with it. And he's one of those guys where it's like, why haven't you written a book about this yet? Because it seems like, <laughs> you know, a level of research. So I'm really excited to have Joe on. I'm glad he made the time to uh, uh, jump on the show here. And I think, you know, a lot of the people who follow the show, I think outdoor skills is definitely, uh, you know, if it's not their primary interest, it's definitely something that I think always have at least a casual interest in. And I think this will inspire some of them. Uh, but yeah, so Joe, welcome to the show. And then, yeah, uh, please tell us your origin story, not just, you know, your, your association with Tom Brown, but other mm -hmm. things you do. I get the impression maybe you've done some martial arts too, just from kind of your... Yes. Okay. So I'd love to hear all, all about all those things. So anyways, welcome to the show, Joe, and uh, tell us your story. First of all, thanks for having me. It's an honor to uh, be here with you guys. Appreciate it. Uh, so let's see. Um, if I had a origin story, it would be that uh, as a child, I was very, very sick as a child. Um, I was born with uh, very severe asthma, which I was inherited on my father's side of the family. And uh, I spent basically my childhood in and out of the hospital, uh, ICU sometimes. Technically, I shouldn't even be here with a uh, childhood like that. But thanks to modern medicine, uh, I'm still here. So as a child, I had a lot of deep thoughts <laughs> concerning life and death. And it kind of led me on the path uh, in my teen years toward uh, two things that I discovered, uh, nature skills and martial arts. So I started uh, martial arts at ta uh, Taekwondo when I was 11. But uh, later I went over to uh, what's called the, the Bujinkan Dojo. People, most people know it as the Ninja Dojo over in Japan. So uh, I started doing that when I was uh, 16. Um, but I found Tom Brown's tracker school when I was a freshman in high school, I was 14. I found his, uh, I found the, uh, the tracker and the search in hardcover at a local library. And uh, then he had the field guides. And then I saw that he had a school in the back of the book. And I realized that he only lived, the school was only 45 minutes from where I lived. Wow. Oh. So yeah. So for most people who go to the school, they come from everywhere. They come from all over the world. But I just, I don't know. 
the luck of the draw was I happened to be born like just down the highway from him. And uh, so uh, I started going there when I was 16 and I started taking every single. So I, uh, that was 1985, 85. I was a senior in high school and uh, I started going there up until 1996 when uh, I guess they realized they couldn't get rid of me and they hired me as an in instructor. <laughs> so um, it was a real honor to work there. Uh, I was an instructor there from 96 to 2005. And, uh, you know, and we covered everything. We like all the skills that we, you saw that we go over in standard and back to back and all the other classes. We, uh, we would be there to support Tom. And uh, finally, in 2001, uh, I decided to uh, start nursing school. Um, I felt I was pretty well-rounded in um, providing things with all the wilderness skills. I felt I was pretty decent uh, having trained since 11 years old in protecting others. So, but I, I felt I severely lacked in healing and preserving life. So I decided to, uh, the short of it is I decided to go to nursing school. I became an RN. I immediately started working in an emergency room. I was there for six years. And uh, today I'm a registered nurse that uh, does infusions. I basically go around to people's homes and I shove an IV in them, which is one of my favorite things to do and uh, <laughs> give them their medicine. And I move on to the next patient. And I, I really love it. It's the greatest job ever. It provides a lot of flexibility, a lot of autonomy, and uh, so I really love it. But um, concerning, let's we'll circle back to uh, Tracker School. Uh, when I was teaching there, yeah, everyone seems to, after a while, fall into their uh, niche, right? They fall into the, like, oh, I kind of gravitate toward one thing, gravitate toward another. And uh, like I was working with an instructor named Ruth Ann. It was obvious that her strengths were um, plants and uh, tanning hides. And then you had like Dan Stanchfield and Kevin, and they were like excellent trackers and everyone seemed to like fall into their thing. So my thing was um, stone tools, primitive cooking and fire making. Like those were my, those were obviously my things. My joke was, is that, uh, well, I really like to eat, but I can't eat till I have a fire and I can't have a fire until I make carve the implements out of stone tools. So stone tools gives me fire and fire gives me food. It often <laughs> so, comes yeah. back to food. Yeah. For sure. It always, it always comes back. To that. <laughs> it's hard to think clearly when you're, you're a little hungry. So uh, anyway, uh, so after I became a nurse, uh, we had left the school and uh, after I have to say in 2010, I kind of just made it uh, in tracker school. There's kind of a culture where you, you really, really want to try to learn everything. And uh, you really, you really can't. And you really should not have any kind of shame or uh, misgivings about settling into the skill that you really want to skill, uh, that you really want to do. So in 2010, I just said, you know what? I'm just going to give up everything, all the skills that I've learned pretty much except friction fire. I really love friction fire. I really want to know everything there is to know about friction fire. And that's what I've been doing since uh, 2010 is just focus on that one skill. And so um, I feel that friction fire is uh, one of those things that belongs to humanity, right? It's just one of those things. So it's uh, if you want to know something about friction fire, I am more than happy to just tell you about it. It's not hidden behind a paywall. It's, I'm not going to like charge you per hour, things like that. I'm just like, hey, this is this is what this is how this works, and that's all there is to it. I'm glad to have discussions about it and everything. I can give you uh, every method uh, known around the world that actually works. It's no problem. I mean, it does it's free? I mean. Uh, they all belong to humanity. So it's just like, 
it's like a, a chocolate chip cookie recipe. Nobody owns a chocolate chip cookie recipe, right? It's just, it's out there for everyone. And um, there's, uh, I've discovered in my training with that, that there's 22 variables that, uh, that you can get any method to work that you're having a problem with. If you could just figure out what the imbalance is in any one of these variables and pretty much in any environment with almost any uh, qualifying material, you can get a fire going with no problem. If you, if you're willing to put in the, uh, what was it? What is it we say at, at tracker school dirt time? You got to put it in your dirt time. You got to really practice. So, uh, or, you know, for us uh, that do martial arts, we would say dojo time, right? You got to put in your dojo time. Yeah, you got to get on the really, mat. You got to get on the mat. You met your mat time, right? So uh, it's the same with any skill you want to do, friction fire. So I discovered that while I was trying to really push my friction fire skill uh, and understanding that it's, uh, it all is this, it's the same as learning in a dojo. Like it's exactly the same. Uh, my sensei once told me when I was very young, uh, if you really want to be really good at your martial arts, you have to have, you have to spend three times the time, three times the money, and three, you have to have three times the grit. Like if you really want to be good at what you do. And uh, it's, it's really true. Like uh, the materials that I've been experimenting with, they're, they're not cheap. <laughs> Especially wood yeah. nowadays. Wood uh, after the pandemic, or still now, wood prices went up incredibly <laughs> because of the shortages and things like that. So you, so uh, how Fire Dojo runs is it's uh, it's bootstrapped. Like uh, I basically, I as I work as a nurse, I take the money that I work as a nurse, and I buy my own materials. I make these kits. Everything comes out of my own, my own pocket, basically. And, uh, and so when it comes to teaching too, I am more than happy, like right now, to do things like this, where I just, I'll donate my time and uh, let you know that if you need help in a certain area, if you want to understand something, I'm, I'm here for you. It's no, it's no problem at all. But uh, if you really want to look, be good at any skill, you gotta, you gotta do your mat time. You gotta really practice. The, the problem is when, when people leave tracker school, uh, I'd say 90% of people just, they leave stuff in their notebook. Like it's really unfortunate, like you, but you know, you, you get back to regular life and life uh, distracts you and you, you fall into old routines. It's hard to like create new, uh, avenues for yourself you have to carve those things out it's like working out right like it's hard to get started but then the, the real thing is you have to maintain and sustain that's really the key you got to have the grit in there regardless to to just keep going so so i hope that's a that's a start right there i guess right? oh very very commendable, very interesting. And it, and it is difficult, like what, what, you, what you teach, uh, what we teach. It, it's not like learning to play an electric keyboard or even a guitar because mm -hmm. you can live in a one bedroom apartment and as long as you have an amplifier with headphones, you can play, practice that guitar much. all the time or the keyboard, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, with us, well, with you, you have to have the equipment, you have to more than likely be outdoors and, and, and have access with us. You have to have many times another training partner and equipment. Right. Yeah. It gets to be difficult, but you're right. You hit the nail on the head with practice. I, I've been teaching for many decades now and people just always ask me, you know, this shortcuts, they want the quick, they want it now. Uh, and many, not everybody. I mean, there's some that do it. Right, it there's right. no shortcuts. There is none. There is none. No, Absolutely not. So well, I'm going to brag a little bit, speaking about no shortcuts. So um, even prior to the standard class, because I uh, confession, I had been to the standard class once before. So in 2017, I was there hmm. and I, the plan was to come back. And so I, you know, then COVID hit and whatnot. And so I finally yes. was able to go back and then I expanded it to the, to the two weeks. 
Um, and kind of leading up to my second uh, trip to out to tracker school, you know, I was working on my skills and, and things, particularly around fire. And um, although kind of to Pony's point about you really should be outdoors, uh, there's a kind of a running joke with a lot of my friends and family now that they're just waiting for me to burn down the house because they're always smelling smoke <laughs> from the basement, you know, <laughs> and they're hearing the squeaking, you know, the squeaking of yes. the, the spindle. <laughs> and then my... Yeah, my my son often refers to our family like our house is the Adams family because like he's like only my dad would be in the basement trying to make fire. <laughs> so uh -huh. who, do you think, who do you think in this neighborhood's making fire right now, Dad? And uh, or trying to make fire is probably more accurate. Um, but just leading up to this week, I'm gonna kind of it's a pseudo brag because it's kind of not a complete success. But the first time uh, I got uh, a good pile of dust and smoke doing the hand drill, and I was able to get it like within about four or five. I didn't get a, a true ember. But I was like, I was, he was making, I was like, oh, wait, I see dust now for the first time. I'm like, yeah. you know, and there's this kind of, uh, maybe we can even touch on it briefly, but there's this kind of weird uh, thing with hand drill where uh, you do have to condition your hands and it takes time. And there's this weird temptation where you want to push through. I, and this is some of the coaching you gave me that's really stuck with me is that, mm. uh, and maybe we can talk about that a little bit. Um, Absolutely. Because I think a lot of what you, like I've seen online with other uh outdoors instructors is just kind of like you got to have these like crazy calloused hands you got to go through this pain you got to you know because you got to you know and so there's this when I was hitting it where I was seeing progress that I hadn't seen before I was trying to like and, and sometimes this can go with working out too where like you're you, you kind of get too I don't know if greedy is the right word or ambitious but you can you can push yourself to the point of injury and then you set yourself back and hand drill is one of those tricky ones where so I'm, I'm like, I, cause I have a running clock to see how long I'm going. And I'm like, okay, Joe, yes. you're, you're, you're four minutes in here. Your hands are feeling kind of hot, you know, yeah. like, but I'm like, this is the most dust and smoke I've ever seen. So I'm like, I got to try, <laughs> you know, it's like, right, right, it's weird. Right. like I got to push through. And so I'm, thankfully I didn't get any blisters in the past. Occasionally I've had some small ones, but I, I, the one, like key, one of the key lessons for hand drill is like, take your time, build up to it because it can like with that first week tracker, when they show it, there was definitely a few guys there who had have bandaged their hands. Like they just were going at it so yeah. fiercely. That, so. Um, and then, yeah, I, what was, I think one of the ethics you talked about is kind of like the idea of the tribe and like your health right, of your correct. 20 of your variables. One of them is your health. Correct. You, yeah. Maybe you can just describe that and that kind of idea. All right. So uh, this, this is what you're hitting on right now is a very, very, very important point that I'm trying to get across to anyone that's interested in friction fire. Uh, I really have to advocate this. And that is, you, you don't have to build up your hands. Like you, you should never get to that point where your, your hands are just ruined. So, and this is after uh, pretty, pretty much spending most of my life doing friction fire. And uh, so the key things is if you don't have the correct materials, this is one of the key things. You have to have the correct materials uh, carved in the uh, correct way. So they're structurally uh, ideal. Um, but on top of that, um, you have to balance all of these variables. So when it comes to hand drill, hand drill is the only method that is going to injure you. And you will, it will be because you did it to yourself. Like it's, uh, for some reason, there's an ideology that you just have to keep going and you have to bust through. This, this is a, this is a uh, cultural aspect of learning hand drill that I, I'm really trying to fight. Um, a hand drill should always, and I mean always, be blisterless and callous less. Like you should not ever have to do that. So hand drill is one of those methods that's like uh, an, uh, a technique that you, that people want to aspire to. Like it's like a, a top line method out of all the methods because it's it's only two sticks, right? It's, it's your uh, one plant spindle and it's the base, it's the hearthboard, and that's all you have. And you are the engine that drives this spindle into the board. Um, the problem is, is thinking that you have to basically kill yourself to, to get this call doing this method. 
And if you have the wrong materials, you're instantly going to harm yourself, thinking that just because you have implements that look like they work, that they're going to work, right? So there's spindles that you always want to be working with, and there's spindles that you should never be working with, and you have to know the difference. So um, in friction fire, fire making, fire keeping, uh, and, and, and Joe, as you know this in uh, tracker school, in the culture of tracker school, you know the, the, the sacred order, right? There's shelter, water, fire, food. And shelter, water, fire, food, uh, I always try to let people know that this is an order of need. It's not an order of skill. I mean, it sounds like skills, but they're actually an order of need. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna come for a full circle on this. Don't worry about it. So uh, shelter is actually regulating body temperature. It's not just about building a shelter because it also pertains to the clothes you wear, right? It has to deal with how your body deals with the environment. So shelter is actually regulating your body temperature. Water isn't just like purification and uh, you know um, filtering. It's really about hydration. Water is about making sure that you're not dehydrated and you're not like losing your mental abilities and your, your organs aren't uh, failing, right? And your muscles aren't cramping. It's really about your health. So fire, fire is uh, an external heat source as well as giving you other kinds of, of fulfilling other kinds of needs. So, but fire is not a, uh, fire is a need, but when it comes to skills, there are four basic skills that you need in order to get fire. You need one, cordage making skills, two, uh, wood working or carving skills, three, you need stone tools, and four, you need plant and tree identification. So you have to find the correct materials. You have to know what correct materials are and what they look like. That's plant tree identification. After you find these raw materials, you have to uh, have tools to be able to uh, carve them down and create them down to structures that are actually going to work. So if you don't have a knife, that's stone tools. Then when you have to be able to utilize these stone tools, you have to be able to know how, to, how wood carves. So there's woodworking. And then finally, for some methods, you're gonna need uh, cordage making for things like pump drills and bow drills and uh, uh, dif different kinds of methods. So uh, having the correct materials and knowing which method is actually going to work uh, under those conditions is very key. And the only way you're gonna know that is by uh, mat time, is by doing it. So just being told, for example, if you, if you have uh, a list of plants that could be used for hand drill, for example, let's say mugwort is on that list. If you collected mugwort at the wrong time of year, under the wrong conditions, it will never work for you. Just because it's on your hand drill spindle list doesn't mean it's going to work. It has to work under very specific conditions. So you could spin and spin and spin until you basically rub your, the skin off your hands down to the bone, which is not gonna help you. So you have to actually know all these things. And uh, if you're not using the correct materials, I just keep reiterating this, you're going to harm yourself. And the problem is not that you're just harming yourself, you're harming, circling back to what you said, you're gonna harm the tribe because it's really about the tribe. A fire keeper's duty is to getting fire for the tribe. Well, now your whole tribe dies because you you didn't balance all the variables and you don't want that to happen. So, because now you can't function and now you can't function because you you basically ruined your hands. So that's a long answer for something that's it. But the, the myth of, we have to dispel the myth of blisters and calluses with hand drill, definitely. So well, where wonder, do all these skills originate from? I mean, are they a Native American thing? Are they Western or European, Asian? Where, give us a little insight. 
Please. Well, it's it's hard to say because it goes back prehistory. Like there's no real way to know. Chances are uh, it's it's begun. It began in Africa when we moved out of Africa and spread out through Europe and Asia, and then finally across the Bering Strait, the land bridge over yeah. into North America, right? So if we follow, and you know, we have the whole, uh, the DNA trail now, like we could, like when you do your DNA and you swab your mouth, we could, how we trace things back now. Uh, chances are it started way, 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 like almost a hundred thousand years ago. Like written, written history only goes back like a few thousand years. So there's, there's really no way to know, but chances are, chances are the first friction fire was a hand drill um, done without a notch because there's a way to do hand drill without a notch. Um, there's a way to do it if you have perfect materials that if you spin it long enough, you're going to get a coal somewhere on the bottom of the spindle near the base. And uh, we, 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 this is, uh, some people call this the, uh, the notch, the notchless method. I call it the pre, the pre notch method, because okay. uh, what you're saying is, is because it predates history, we, we discovered somehow that a notch allows a place for a coal to form. I, uh, I almost imagine that in history, a guy or someone was spinning a spindle, trying to get a coal, and he probably did it near a crack in the wood. And somewhere in the crack, most of the dust collected. And then they discovered that a notch is better than having no notch at all. And that's how we came to like carve the notch is my, um, my hypothesis. I can't prove it. But I think that uh, clearly the hand drill has probably got to be humanity's first method to figure out fire, probably. There's no way to know. There's honestly no way to know. We can't, unless we have a time machine and we can go back and, and go see what our ancestors did. But um, as uh, the hand drill probably spread across cultures, uh, and uh, they, uh, as humans tend to do, they evol uh, evolved the technology along with it. Like they, they added, uh, 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 like the, the Inuit people, the Eskimo people, they added a, a pressure mouth brace. Like they have a brace that they put in their mouth and they, they use their neck and their body weight to push down on the spindle, which uh, kind of helps. Or um, like Joe, you were talking about the Egyptian drill. They have a, a pressure hand brace which they put on top and they're allowed to, to create more pressure. They put their whole body weight on top of it. And then they add a cord to it with a bow and they, all kinds of things. So we, we added technology along the way, but chances are it was the hand drill, the simple hand drill. Probably someone was just playing around one day. Somebody probably just was, just took a stalk and, and spun it. And it just, they decided, they found it was warm on the bottom. And then some guy just kept going and going until finally they got a goal is probably how that happened. Uh, there's no way to know, but that's my, that's what we guess. I'm sure. I get the impression. That's how a lot of our humanities discoveries happened. I think like they, the, they do. Like they I, do. I, when they, we talked about stone tools briefly, I think, um, you know, the kind of joke was that it was like, you know, someone was uh, you know, pissed about something and threw some rocks down. Exactly. And, exactly. And they, oh, that's look, exactly right. I've got, yep. I've got a sharp edge. I got a shard. <laughs> <laughs> this looks useful, you know, and so, or whatever, you know, I think even like the discovery of, you know, uh, smelting metals and things is people are just throwing stuff into the fire to see what it looks like I, or what happens and all this. I like, have hey, no doubt. I have no you know, doubt. It's just kind of our playful, whatever. We just kind of observe. And actually this kind of was one of the overarching themes, um, you know, uh, from uh, the tracker school and actually like what Tony teaches with self-defense. And actually it's, it's, it's interesting you mentioned nursing school because I'm going to uh, EMT school for almost the exact same reason awesome. you are, that I want to awesome. kind of be a healer too. And, um, but all three of those disciplines, like almost out of the gate, step one is observation and, and, and situational awareness Correct. and paying attention to what's going on around you. 
Um, you know, you know, like as an EMT, you don't want to walk into somewhere where maybe there's carbon monoxide poisoning going on or, you know, chemical right. spill, right. you know, or, or some violence. And, and so it's right. funny just as a, a, a human trait, like, you know, this is how we make discoveries. This is how we, like you said, you, you find uh, like, you know, you're going out about your, um, you know, setting up your shelter and your things, you should be paying attention to what's around you, what your resources are and all that. Or, you know, like in, in our self-defense case, you know, like who's coming up behind you, what's going on around right, you. It's, right. it's just kind of like a, a very important um, uh, skill set that uh, we have to, I think, deliberately focus on, you know, and in any of these pursuits, I think it's kind of a universal truth. Um, I think you're hundred percent correct there, actually. Um, I want to ask you, so, you know, we've talked about how many uh, friction methods are there that you're aware of? Okay, right. So uh, it's, it's, I could say right off the bat, right? that there's a core nine, like there's nine, but then there's variations of those nine, right? So, um, and in those nine, right? Uh, six of them are what I call drill or axis methods. And the other three are linear methods that go back and forth in a, in a line. So, um, on the drill side, right? We have hand drill, mouth drill, bow drill, and they're and all of these have variations. Pump drill, and what I call to a toggle drill, uh, and a and then finally there's a gaucho's drill. Gaucho's drill. Uh, if anybody who's done uh, old time woodworking would recognize uh, an old. Uh, carpenter's bit and brace when you yeah. uh, drill into something that's a gaucho's drill and it really does yeah. work so but um the gaucho's drill is the only one of the drills that does not have a straight spindle right because you have to cross through the center axis when you're when you're doing the the drilling so so there's six drills with variations and then on the, the linear side, you have the fire uh, plow. So you have like a, a blade and you go uh, parallel sh straight back and forth on a, another stick, okay? You have the fire saw, which goes uh, perpendicular, which goes across the stick. And uh, as a kid, as a kid, you uh, you may have grabbed two sticks and tried to go like this. That fire saw kind of looks like that. Mm. And then you have the what's called the fire thong, and uh, the fire thong is uh, a flexible strip of rattan that goes around a branch, and you kind of mm. like you're trying to cut through it with this uh, piece of rattan, and uh, a coal forms in a in a notch that you have on the branch, so. Uh, and all of these are, are uh, kind of regional in a sense. So hand drill is very universal because it's found on every continent. Um, mouth drill uh, is basically around the Arctic circle. It's found in the Inuit peoples. So uh, their variations of the mouth drill are a, uh, a toggle drill, but they have a cord wrapped around the drill and they have two little toggles and they go back and forth this way, or they have like a mouth uh, bow drill, which they do that way. So those are variations of mouth drill. The Egyptian drill uh, is well, is, well as, it's, as it says, it's from Egypt. There's higher, uh, hieroglyphs, what do you call them? Pic pictographs. Uh, hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics. Hier yes. You can actually see guys, you know, going like, like holding down the handhold with the with the bow, and uh, so it, date, it dates back a long, long time. In fact, they used to drill holes in the the stone, the limestone that way. So it's it's a it's a serious piece of technology back then back then in the day. Um, pump drills is is found in certain. Areas. It's hard to say where it really came from. Uh, where a pump drill comes from, but it's a, it's an awesome piece of technology, regardless, with its flywheel and its use of uh, centrifugal force with the flywheel. 
A toggle drill is also uh, Inuit people, the Eskimo people, but it requires two people to do. And uh, I'll circle back to this, but the toggle drill enables you to be able to do any wood in the world if you, if you build it correctly, no matter how hard the wood is, uh, if, it's, if, it's, uh, if it's a qualifying wood, you're going to get a fire going using a toggle drill if you can. So that's like the fallback method to uh, get pretty much anything going. So uh, fire plow has to be a very, very soft wood in order to get going. Uh, it's found usually in the Pacific Islands. The Samoans are famous for fire plow and um, they use a uh, hibiscus uh, vegetation, which is found all around the Pacific. Fire saw, the most famous fire saw is a bamboo fire saw. Uh, they did it in J Japan, the Philippines, around Asia. And fire thong is, uh, you can only do with either rattan and a close second is bamboo. So the fact that rattan is not anywhere in the, in the Americas is the reason why that method never developed in the Americas is because it's, it's uh, environmentally, regionally, uh, since that plant is only found in, uh, I think it's the South Pacific. It's, it's very famous with the um, Papua New Guinea people, uh, which is above Australia. Uh, those peoples, they, that's their standard method because uh, they have plenty of rattan there and they just like, uh, there's plenty, if you don't know what that is, there's plenty of video on, on YouTube, just Google uh, fire thong. Uh, careful with that. And that's that's right, I was gonna, <laughs> I was gonna say, uh, that's, that's my next sentence is be careful what you, be careful what you YouTube, you don't know what's gonna pop up. But... It's unfortunate that it's a regional thing because I think Joe would be really good with the thong um, <laughs> type of thing. So in the hands of an expert like yourself, Generally speaking, how long does it take to start a fire? Uh, well, again, that uh, it depends on how you balance the variables. So what materials do I have? What are the conditions that I'm under, right? What tools do I have to be able to create the, the method that I think is going to work? So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, a lo it's a loaded, broad question. So uh, in... Uh, Let's start with uh, tracker school, right, Joe? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you're given some materials. You're given to you're given materials that you know are are going to work. But now it's up to you to kind of get them structurally relevant to where they where if you put them together in a certain way and you move them in a certain way, the results is going to be a dust pile that's ignited, and then you'll have a a lit coal. So the goal of a friction fire is you rub certain woods or plants together, you get a pile of dust and it, you get what looks like the lit tip of a cigarette, right? A cigarette is just um, a, basically a very long coal that burns down. And that's essentially what you're trying to get is a dust pile that's lit in the end. And you're going to have a, a makeshift, uh, a tinder bundle, like a fibrous bundle that's hopefully very dry, you'll put the coal in the tinder bundle and you'll blow that into flame. And hopefully you will have uh, gathered wood for your TP fire. You put that in your TP fire, you light your TP fire, and hopefully you survive, <laughs> your tribe survives doing that. But um, the, the funny thing about friction fire is that it's uh, what I, it's, it's obviously uh, obsolete and obscure like who cares like who cares about friction fire like the 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 standard regular joke right when you're teaching friction fire is, is somebody pulls out a liar and goes here here here's your fire and start flicking the back right it's it's obscure and obsolete like who cares like who needs that it's like an ipod nowadays like no one has an ipod <laughs> everyone has an iphone or things like that it's it's outdated technology but um as a, uh, the, the reason why I keep doing friction fire is it's still, it's, it's, uh, it's fast, it's scientifically fascinating to me 
because I'm starting now to get into realms of materials that no one has ever used. Like I'm probably, I'm like, Hey, no one's ever done this wood before. And I just want to let you know that it does work. Like here it is. And I, I make videos of like, Hey, no one would ever thought to use a wood this hard, but you can do it. So uh, one of the things that I've done is uh, I've organized all the methods into uh, a small hierarchy of like, if you can't get uh, a, a material uh, with this method, try this method and then you'll probably get it. And if that one, one doesn't work, try this method. And then you get all the way to toggle drill. And if like toggle drill will almost guarantee any material will work after that. So it's been, it's been a fascinating road to get anything that comes in my hands, back to your question. It's been a fascinating road to get anything that comes into my hands to ignite, no matter what it is, like woods that no one would have, would have even considered. So for example, there's a, one of the hardest known woods in the world is bull oak from Australia. And years ago, like, uh, I think it was like 20, 2011 or something like that. Uh, thank goodness for the internet. <laughs> but like, I got online with a woodworker from Australia. I'm like, hey, do you have any bull oak? And he's like, yeah, I got some bull oak. He goes, I go, how much do you want for it? He goes, well, I don't need money. Maybe you could send me some woods from America that I don't have. I'm like, deal. I'm like, you got it. So he sent me like these these um, pieces of bull oak, they're like rocks. Like they're just like, they're so dense. They're like, they were literally like bricks. They're so heavy. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you, it's, it's, I got a fire going with that. If you have the right, if you have all the variables balanced, you could literally get any, any wood material to, to ignite after a while. So. So kind of you're mentioning, mm -hmm. uh, for those who are not familiar, there's you, you kind of introduced me, there's a scale of a hardness when it comes to uh, wood. The Janka hardness scale, J-A-N-K-A, -A, Janka hardness, I think that's how you pronounce it. And uh, just go on, like, just, just Google Janka hardness wiki, and wiki will quickly explain to you what it is, but um, they fire a steel ball it's, there's a machine that fires a steel ball into a, a sample of wood. And depending on how, how far this ball goes halfway into the wood is a measurement of its uh, density. And uh, they've pretty much, at any commercially, commercially known wood, they have a junk, a hardness measurement for it. So what I've been doing is I've been uh, finding every single wood that has a Janka measurement on it to uh, I try to get a, uh, a call off of and practice with that. So, and then I just check it off and check it off my list. I'm basically going down the entire uh, availability of trees around the world. Doesn't matter where it's from or so. Hey, you I've, been doing, I've been doing, I've been doing insane different kinds of like woods that you wouldn't even imagine like ebony osage orange <laughs> purple heart like woods woods people haven't even heard of like woods i haven't even heard of i'm like what is that what what is that like i go online like i've never heard of that before and like i'm like i gotta get some of that try it out like no matter Make some cue sticks out of purple heart believe it or not cool cues i almost bought one but i i, I chose not to <laughs> was it expensive <laughs> they're <laughs> Like, but not yeah. not out of no i mean it was not really like super you know they're, they're all custom made so they're going to be more than sure. off the shelf uh, off sure. the, but no <clears throat> no they weren't but i just didn't think the playability would have been there you know um nothing beats a maple shaft if you're in a wood for shooting pool but sure, uh, now they sure. use composites and everything sure. but joe had a question for you i think joe what were you going to say yeah well, sorry uh, we'll just kind of back to tony's observation well i kind of a, a couple different questions but what i've seen so I guess my observation, would you agree with this, that really the, once you've got the skill set honed, it's really the prep time to, uh, depending, like, let's say mm. if you have no tools, you've got to get the tools together, you've got to get the kit together, that could take, 
I don't know, hours easily. But like once what I've seen is when these people at a minimum hours. Yeah. Yeah. And a minute now, like I was going to ask you, like, what's realistic if you're if you're walking in there without your steel knife to like? It seems like to me, I, I, it seems like it could be a really lengthy process. But <laughs> once you have the actual kit set up, uh, w- like w- once an expert, I should say, or someone who's who's good has a kit set up, you can get a coal within a minute or two. So like a oh, hand yeah. drill, like with, a, with sure. someone who knows hand drill, once you're set up, boom, you've got the coal, you know, you right. got everything set up. So it's really, it's the gathering your materials, prepping. That's the, you know, and like I said, if you, if you don't have a knife with you, you know, then you got to make stone tools. And so like, yeah. And, and like kind of like a worst, I don't know, a worst case scenario, but like the, that's the longest amount of time. And so like, you, I mean, it, I don't know, is it, is it reasonable to say it could take a couple of days to fashion tools and get, you know, the materials. I mean, everything's leading up to that. And then like, then you have to have the skill to actually execute. <laughs> so that's absolutely um, right. Yeah. Make I had a, point. Good, good. No, no. I was just going to say I had a buddy who, uh, and maybe it's telling. He was a he was a marine, but a uh, very overconfident marine. But he had never done any primitive training, and he he basically I kind of you know I, I kind of got on the subject with him, and maybe he was thinking he was going to use the bick in his pocket, but he's like, yeah, I could walk into the woods and within an hour, I, and I'm like, uh, what do you got <laughs> with you, buddy? Because you know. Because yeah, I can imagine him. It's just like uh, just I, I can see him picturing rubbing two sticks together in frustration, <laughs> but not really. It's it. Yeah, the I think people underestimate how much. Like uh, uh, to your point earlier about like when I do the um, the bow drill, I I always qualify with everybody that I'm cheating because I have an artificial cord, you know, on there. Right, right, but right. I have not fashioned a cord. Right. That's a whole other, you know. Right. Um. So and yeah, not to mention assuming even the conditions are perfect. Because what if it's raining out? you know that's exactly uh, right you know so i mean yeah what is the worst worst you know i can't even it, it, i feel it's like the observation well it could always be worse like i can imagine it could always be harder to make you know when the more you think about the different variables that are in there um it's yeah it's hard to it, like, it's hard to give a straightforward answer but like in, in in dry conditions when you have a kit fashioned whether it's a bow drill or a hand drill i see guys who know they're doing like in a minute or two they have a coal yeah. going and they've right. got a fire going so it's all the prep work that's the the lengthy part so I don't know if there was a question in there, an observation, but I, like, I guess, yeah, if you could expound on that, if you have any other thoughts. No, you're, that's 100% right there, what you're, what you're saying. So when I do demonstrations for like scouts or groups or whatever, um, I have, everything is made. And I, I, always, I always let people know that like, okay, I'm about to light this up, but you're missing like 98% of what I've done. Like 98%, like, I had to gather everything. I had to carve everything. I had to put everything together. I had to, you know, so what you're, what you're seeing here right now is me just assembling them and uh, heating them up and lighting them up. Like that's, that's, that's like nothing. (laughs) That's like nothing. Like it's, it's uh, time-wise like, uh, uh, so, uh, I think one of the reasons why no one really, and I mean nobody, nobody really practices friction fire, fire keeping, is because somewhere instinctually, they know it's a lot of work. Like it's a lot of work. Um, but one of the reasons why I think why I have taken this on is because I enjoy that work. I don't see it as work. I actually get more out of building the the sets and the kits and the methods and the techniques. I I enjoy that so much that sometimes I don't even care whether I light it up or not. I'm like that, like just getting the set to where it will work for me is so much fun. It's fun for me. And uh, having done that all these years, I've really fallen in love with uh, with woodworking, and and the process of creating something. But if you if you just see if you just need the end result, you're not going to put in the work. Like you're not going to do the work. And uh, we see this in martial arts all the time. Someone wants to be an expert at something, but they're not willing to do any mat time at all. Like not at all. Like and they and then you have people that like never come back. You have people that show up at a dojo or your, your training center, you, you see them once or twice, and then they never come back because now they realize that this is work. 
this is a lot of work and it's it takes years it take it takes me years years and years and i'm not even done i think i'm just getting started like there comes a point like in your in your martial arts training where you think you know after like what 10 15 20 25 30 years of training in martial arts that you're like you know what i think i'm i think i'm getting the gist of this now right and then you're because the best the best experts and masters don't think of themselves as experts and masters they still think of themselves as students i still think of myself as a student like i'm just getting started now like i i've realized i've gotten into a rhythm where like i've uh i'm collecting materials from around the world where i'm like oh okay now i'm gonna practice on this now i'm gonna practice on that because I don't know what it's going to do. I have to keep challenging myself. Challenge yourself, challenge yourself, challenge yourself. That's how you're going to keep getting better. There's never going to be a point where I'm like, I, I know everything there is to know, right? Who, we, you, you automatically lose respect for somebody that thinks that they know everything that there is that they're supposed to know, right? Especially a martial artist. Like, you just like, really? I don't, I doubt it. I sincerely doubt it because the best people I know are still trading, no matter how good they are. So, you know, to your point, I so I took an acting class um, a while ago, and the the teacher kind of said, you know, if you're going to be an actor, embrace loving auditioning, right? Embrace embrace it, and, and know you're going to get rejected, like, like right. you know that you're going to spend 90% of your time going to auditions that are just a waste of time. You have to enjoy that because that is a lot of the job of like, most people think my job as an actor is the performance, but it's like, no, a big part of your work day is going on these auditions time after time. So enjoy that, savor that, you know? And uh, yeah, I think if you can reframe your mental saying, yeah, I've got it. You know, I don't want the, whatever the end result is, it's like the process you have to be to uh, find a way to enjoy or, or, or right. anticipate it, you know? It's the process, um, that's exactly right. So um, like, uh, there's a lot of failure in what I do. I'm like, I'll try something and like, oh, that did not go the way I thought it was going to go. Like, it, that didn't work. What am I doing wrong? But this is what I really like. I like the challenge. Like, oh, now, I, now I'm pushing myself to knowing something new, learning something new. You just have to just keep going, keep going, keep going. We say that in our martial art all the time. Japanese for let's keep going. Let's just keep going, keep going, keep going. No matter how old you are, no matter how far you've already gone, you just got to keep going. And uh, this is one of the reasons why I think I love friction fire so much is I found my thing where I could just like keep going. So that's good. So many people don't find it. They they're wanderers, you know, their whole life. They're searching they're like gypsies. Yeah, right. And I kind of feel bad for them because uh, while I give them credit for still having that thirst, I just wish it could get quenched for you. You found your love of what you do for me. As mm -hmm. far as relating to the martial arts, I know what style I do is the best for me. And same with my music, mm -hmm. you know, sure. Um, but others, you know, I tell people kind of too, like you brought up, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, what you, it didn't work out the way you planned. Like, it's like an experiment. It, it's like a songwriter. Songwriters, man, they write hundreds, right. sometimes thousands of songs. Right. Most of them stink. You know, they're no good. They hope for that one or two that hit big, but they don't quit writing songs. But true, the thing about a songwriter or a musician is they never go against the laws of music, okay? Mm -hmm. um, I see athletes sometimes trying to break the laws of physics they're they're just doing techniques that they're just are not going to work okay give it up uh you know the the percentage would be incredibly low um so that's the thing with you you're grounded in the sciences so as long mm. as you stick to the science you mm. know for example you're not going to take a stick a wooden stick and a rubber ball probably and try right, to right. you know you know better but right. sometimes i see guys you know attempting to do things and you know, from a physics standpoint or physical it's anatomy, work. it's just not, it's not proper. So, you know, it's sometimes difficult to get through to those people because they're vested in what they're doing and they get kind of like, 
the, those are the types that come to one, once or twice and then don't want to work out again. It's hard. And you, you never know with uh, who, who the person that's going to stick around is going to be. Right. Yeah. Cause uh, in, in our dojo for a long time now, like there's, there's people still there that like, I thought would not, would not show up another day. Right. My, my, my sensei once told me, you know, you, you, you tell, tell, tell me this to me. I thought you were going to give up. I thought, like, <laughs> I thought you were going to never come back, but here you still, <laughs> you're still here. <laughs> I'm like, thanks. <laughs> Tony's been trying to get rid of me for years, honestly. Um, so, Boy, but you don't know, you don't know until years later. So I've, I've learned not to discount anyone. I'm just like, look, if you show up, I'll teach you and train you. But if you don't show up, I'm not going to, I'm not going to hunt you down. I like, I'm not yeah. going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to twist your arm. That's well, right. I will. Right, right, right. <laughs> no, I, I'm no. the same way, you know, That's it. You, you, you come to me, you know, I mean, I'm here, but yeah, I'm not going to go search you out. You know, like right, I'm right. not going to be pleading with you to send me videos or something. So no, I can not do that. No, that's just how it is. Like with my co, uh, well, like with my music teachers, for example, that I've had, cause I had a few, uh, same thing, you know, except for one, same. Same. I normally went to them, you know, one guy used to come to my house, but I used to go to them. And if I showed up unprepared, you know, it's like, well, you're not going to learn anything today. Okay. Right. You, you, you gotta, you, you gotta, gotta still study that. Yeah. Do your, you do your homework. Got to put in the work. Exactly. Put in the work. But yeah, no, it's just, but it's a fascinating thing. Cause yeah, Joe was all cranked up about, um, <laughs> you know, the uh, fire when he came back from the, the tracker, by the way, do you know a guy named Mike Hanek? Mike Hanek. Where, where from? Boston area, East coast. Boston area. <clears throat> he it was a tracker say- dude. <laughs> oh, probably there's, well, there's, there's tens of thousands. <laughs> it, well, it I don't know. It doesn't say it doesn't sound familiar, but. Okay. Nobody seems to know whatever happened to him, but uh, he had done some martial art video. I, I, I've lost touch with him for like, I haven't seen him in 20 years or something like that, okay. but, uh, All right. but he was a big, tr- big time um, tracker. Okay. Uh, he's, but I'm sure he's done some of this stuff as well, but I can't, I can't testify to that, but I know tracking was his thing, you know, and uh, he used to tell me some cool stories about things that he was able to do, like literally, sneak up track up onto a deer and touch the deer with his hand oh, that yeah, was yeah. his whole thing like yeah, this got to be high smack, level right? isn't deer huh? smack, i think in, at the tracker school isn't that deer smacking or deer smacking, deer smacking. so that is a that is a, a, a almost a rite of passage with this group where they yeah trying yeah. to hey uh, that could do that you know um so yeah, it's tracked mice you know of uh, you know what they're oh the, it's a, it was I wish we could get a hold of him because I'd just like to talk to him again. Hey, how you doing? But have him on the show, maybe with Joe at the same time. Joe Lau, you know, it would be great. There's you know? uh, at the at tracker school, a lot of skills, uh, a lot of, oh, I should say a lot of people's abilities can sometimes be elevated to mytho- mythology level. <laughs> but uh, uh, here, here's, here's the one thing that I will say about uh, fire dojo is that I will never make a claim that I can't prove. So, which is why I put out like tons of video. Like I'm like, okay. And I don't edit when I'm doing the the friction fire. Like I don't cut scene and all of a sudden I have a coal or something like that. Like a, a coal came out of nowhere. Like they do on these like survival shows. I'm like, if I can't do it, I'll just say like, I haven't done that yet, or I can't, I haven't, I can't do it yet, but I have no, I have, I'm very, very big on proof. Proof is, is huge. And especially now in today's day and age, video proof is, is everything. And I just, uh, every week I just put out something new. Uh, I just, I have to show people that uh, this works, this works. And I'll, I'll show failures too. Like, Oh, I didn't get it going this time. I'm going to try again later. Like it's, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, it do, that's what dojo it's like uh, fire dojo is a dojo. When you, when you train on the mat, you're training your mistakes 
so that you get better. Like you're, oh, that didn't work. When I did this arm bar on this guy, it didn't work. You know, when when I got down and in, uh, into an immobilization technique, it didn't work. When I tried this punch, it didn't work. Well, that's what dojo time is, right? It's like, it, it doesn't work. And you have to be okay. You have to be 100% okay with like, it doesn't work until you figure out how to get it to work. And, but you, I'm big on proof. You have to, I think, I think in today's day and age, it's even more important to show uh, your road to figuring something out. Like we're starting to see, I think more and more of that, like, all right, I'm trying to do this. I didn't succeed. I'm going to try again. Oh, look, it worked this time. So I learned something and we have to be, we have to like put our egos aside and let people know that we're, we're human and that, well, here's the thing. You can do this too. See, the thing about friction fire is uh, a lot of people think that you just, you can't do it or it's, it's, it itself is a mythology, but you can do it. And I'm, I'm here to kind of show that like all these methods that I list actually work, but you have to figure out how they work. I'm willing to show you how they work, the materials you need to get them to work, the variables you need to balance to get them to work, right? It's it's same in music. In music, you you can't just jazz. You have to have done your scales for yeah, years right. and years and years. You have to have done like every chord on every scale for years and years and years. And then maybe you can jazz. Everybody wants to jazz. Like everybody wants to pick up a guitar and start jazzy like right away pick up a saxophone i just want to jazz like you can't do that <laughs> you no, have to man. you have to do your dojo time you got to fail well, you, and fail and fail you you talk about the you know the video proof and even that can be doctored well i shit sent joe cardinal i don't know how long ago it was seven months ago it doesn't matter a few video links of of these experts doing yeah, martial arts that jazz, was so yeah. terribly ridiculous terribly so poor uh, and I'm like, Joe, look at this. And he, these people have like a million views and all these accolades. And, and it scares me because the people who are writing all these, you know, these words of praise, they don't even, they're so, I don't know what the word is, indoctrinated, or I don't know, yes, brainwashed. Yeah. They don't realize what they're watching is absolutely terrible. This is not what you want to do. You I, don't ever want to do this. I and agree. that's for me, because I seem to be like you, I think. I was a perfectionist. And I had no problem going at doing things over the same thing right. over, and over, over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Okay. And to the point where my, this is with fighting, my one coach said, stop. Okay. Stop now. Okay. You've got to, you, 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 you've mastered it. Move on. All right. Now you got to start. You got this cold, you got this down, move on. But I never thought I did. I always wanted to go more, 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 but yeah. So I see a lot of that, especially in the martial arts world, because that's, you know, what I do for a living, I guess, but um, it, so it's hard, you know, um, even with music, I don't watch martial art videos on uh, YouTube or anything. I don't go to any of those forums, but sure. I do watch, I watch music videos on um, uh, YouTube and, and I gave up like watching new people. I just listened to the old you know, established artists now because yeah, while I did run into a, a few guys who were really good guys and gals, uh, most of it was just, you know, oh my God, you don't really, you shouldn't be making a video. <laughs> You're not good <laughs> enough yet. Right. Right. So but like think, somebody wanted me to, uh, well, I'll tell you the story later, but when we're off camera, but I told you, I got to tell you what happened yesterday. Well, somebody wanted, it was somebody's 60th birthday and they begged me, you know, to play the accordion. And I'm like, I just, I'm not going to do it, you know, because I have my level of where I think I, you know, I have standards and I'm way below those standards, man. Okay. I, you know, so I just wasn't going to do it, you know, but um, yeah, some people just don't, I guess what they, there's an expression, um, have you no shame, right? Some, <laughs> some of these people are like, they, they shouldn't be putting out <clears throat> stuff, you know, but well, who knows why? I don't I know. Agree. I guess it's, it's cool to do it, I guess. I think that those videos, like those videos that you could just tell, they're like, they're, I don't know how to say, they're full of it, right? That in itself is proof. It's unfortunate if you don't have the, the experience and the knowledge to understand that what you're looking at is fraudulent. Yeah. 
because the novice will be tricked, but the pro is not going to be tricked. Like they are going to know. So um, I, I can only speak for myself. I can't speak for other people. But when I put something out, I know that there's people who understand the skill of friction fire. And if they're looking at it, they're going to know that this is not BS. So mm -hmm. I, I hope that when I put something out, or if any of us put anything out, we've already set ourselves to a higher bar that we're not, uh, if the whole point of putting something out should be to prove something, but you know when someone's putting something out because their ego is involved or yeah. they're trying to elevate themselves for some psychological reason or financial reason or something like that. It's, it's unfortunate, but that in itself is a kind of proof that they're full of it, I think, if you know what you're looking for. Yeah. You have to That's, recognize it. But I think, right. I think you're right there. I think you're correct there. Yeah, it's it, it's it's sad. And like I said, in, in today's day and age, people are Google smart. You know, they'll <laughs> they everything is just, you know, and you can you can literally send somebody down into a dangerous situation, you know, right. giving out sure. phony health sure. like you're a nurse. So oh, if you give out God. phony health advice, I mean, you know, the internet you know is littered with you know, pseudoscience and, you know, quackery. And it, it, oh, I totally. guess it's always been the case. It's exhausting. Um, oh, it, it is exhausting. I, exhausting. I had somebody that I knew once, I won't mention who, personal. And, uh, you know, she was every apple cider, apple cider vinegar could cure everything. Everything. Uh, okay. Um, you, you know, that, and, 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 it, and it just went on from there, right? right. There, it was, you can't r rationalize with these people. So... Yeah. I know. I can't. I just say, forget it. Okay, goodbye. You know, <laughs> see ya. <laughs> that kind of deal. I, I but, hear that. I'm the same, actually. I'm at a point where <laughs> if I, if I, well, I used to do ER. ER. I was in the emergency uh -huh. room for six, six years. And um, all right. So here's the thing about being in the ER. Uh, you have like four or five rooms that are yours, your section. We call it a pod. So you have your pod. Right. So uh, an emergency room is basically a multiple casualty incident that's uh, controlled in a controlled area because all there is is like crises coming in through the door and you're just kind of putting them into rooms. So it's okay. a multiple casual. Right. So you're one route like you have an asthma attack here. You have a heart attack here. You have this. Um, uh, a psych case here, right? You have a broken leg here. You've got all kinds of things you have to deal with, but they're yours. Like they're like they're mine. Like I have to deal with them. So when it when I had like uh, like a couple of medical cases, and then I have a psych case, I can't spend a ton of time with a psych case, right? Because they'll talk and talk and talk. I, I, don't don't get me wrong. I'm I'm one hundred percent sympathy. For, for mental illness and things like that. But I have someone over here who's potentially dying in the next room and in this room over here. So I, I can't just be talking with you, trying to figure stuff out. So I learned like through experience, like right away, how quickly, how reasonable and rational you could be. And then I just have to kind of just move on and figure out what I need to do from there. This is, and I'll tell you what, that elevated my martial arts training to a very high level to figure that out. Cause I, I can know right away whether this is a dangerous situation, which could escalate and whether I, it, whether it requires de-escalation for, it could be potentially violent. And um, I would let, I could let security know and the other staff know and let the doctor know and have medications ready just in case like things like that. So I, I know what you I know what you mean. I know what you say like about how you how you can communicate with someone where they're receptive or not to to reality to reality. I should say right. Yeah, correct. Thanks, Thanks Tony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 and and it's the same thing with uh, 
with this with the martial arts or or uh, I would assume uh, religion. I remember. Uh, well, I guess I could say this, you know, uh, we had this my ex wife. Well, she wasn't my ex. She wasn't even my wife yet at the time, but we're divorced mm -hmm. now. But she knew this pastor, um, old old guy from originally from Alabama or something like that. But he was just a cool old dude, just really mm -hmm. interesting guy. And, you know, I'm not in, you know, I don't necessarily share their belief things and all that, regardless. But he comes over to the house for dinner and, uh, you know, him and I were talking. And I'm like, you know, you and I actually are quite similar because, you know, people go to you for spiritual counseling or spiritual improvement, let's say. Okay. And people come to me for other sorts of improvement. Sometimes it is spiritual, even with me, like they may have certain men, it may have low self-esteem and, you know, they think that fighting or whatever will build up their self-esteem. So, um, you know, you, him and I, so you, we both have to learn how to look into people, kind of read people. Um, True. Yes, but he, you know, when he brought up the point that, you know, there's a point where you just, you know, he's like, I'm not going to get into it with a stone cold atheist because it's just going to be a clash of heads, not going to go anywhere. So, right, right. and so that's kind of how sometimes it has to be when we're dealing with people, I think, that don't have our same opinions or, or um, they're so, uh, you know, uh, obtuse about things. No need to get insultive. Just say, hey, you know what? You think two plus two is five? You know, I don't. Hey, no big deal. Hey, let's. Hey, how about how about those Cleveland Browns? You know, right, let's right. change the subject. Right? <laughs> how about this? How about the Cubs? How about those right, Cubs? Right, right. You know? right. <laughs> so you try to find common ground, and if you, then if you find out you just can't even find any common ground, then this person's probably not one hundred percent. I think I think you're hitting something right on the right the head, the nail right on the head there. It's what? it's it's a much better thing to get off something that's divisive and separatist yeah. and get onto something where that connects that's our similarities in humanity are very important. Like that's vital. What you just said is vital. If that, that could go out to the world, that would, we would, we would already be in a better place with what you just said. Well, so thanks. And I, well, you know, with, with Joe Cardinal's good looks, this podcast gets billions and billions of views. So many views that I get hate letters from McDonald Corporation people because we're serving billions and billions we, right? because of Joe. <laughs> you guys are great. Yeah. Well, you know, I think it's all Joe's relatives, but you know, I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, you've been a great guest. I think unless Joe, you have something to add. We, uh, I did have one. So I know we're, oh. kind, of, we're kind of running, but it's, it's, it's kind of on the martial arts realm. And maybe, I don't know if this might be opening up a whole, this might be a, 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 honestly a conversation for another sure. podcast. If you well, want to come back, go for it. But, um, so I want to touch on, uh, so, uh, Bujin Khan, you know, I'm, I'm familiar yes. with it from the outside and sure. Tom Brown, it seems to me there would be like what is it, what's the overlap there what are some things that uh uh yeah i don't know what are some parallels there do you, do you see that between oh the yeah, two? yeah and yeah. um you know uh yeah i used uh, to write about that oh, back okay in the day. so i'll tell you what the main thing is the main thing the main themes between tracker culture wilderness survival and uh, the, the whole ninja thing is that you just want you and yours to survive and thrive. And you're not wishing any ill will on anyone. You just want to make sure that your kids, your grandkids, your great grandkids go on and have good lives. And um, that's really all. Like it's, it's the same things that we... It gets down to the, the lowest common denominator that what you want for yours, I also want for mine. Like on this, when it comes to the, what Tony just said, the, on, on the things that are the same, shelter, water, fire, food, right? All the same. Doesn't matter what human being you are, those things are the same. Uh, security, and what is it? Maslow's hierarchy, right? So, you know, physiological needs, safety and security, you know, uh, love, and then, you know, self, what does it go? Self-actualization, something. So all of those basic things are the same. 
when we when we get down to uh, stone tools, making an arrowhead, or you know, cooking over a fire, or you know, uh, <laughs> trading with a spear down in scout class, we're just getting down to the the foundations of what it is to be human again protecting art so uh i used to present it in this way when i was teaching so uh in tracker school we have the thing called the scout right the scout was a kind of a high level person with a uh, skill in the tribe the scout well the scout's uh role was uh life supporting information gathering and problem solving. Like that's really the scout's role. So, but under the umbrella of uh, Joe, what you talked about before was, and Tony is awareness, right? Awareness of stuff around you is highly important. Like that you're gonna be an EMT, Joe. Uh, scene safety is like very important. Like no matter what, whether you are a provider, a hunter gatherer, whether you are a protector, a warrior, defender of life, whether you're a healer, right? A doctor, a nurse, an EMT, uh, a radi radi uh, radiation tech, like it doesn't matter. Uh, all of these vocations, all of these roles have to do with supporting life, right? We just want, we want yours, you and yours to be fine but we want the same, we want me and ours to be fine. And that's what we find common ground on with Tracker and with uh, Bujigan. And that's it in a nutshell. But I used to get into like cultural specifics and things like that. But Yeah, I think that's a great overview. And at some point I'd like to pick up <clears> on, <throat> on very specifics, but I, we've been obviously, you know, that's that's that probably like another couple hours. <laughs> so I, maybe, I hear that. maybe we can have you back sometime. That would be great. And yeah, delve into I appreciate that. it. Because I agree with you there too, you know, and I feel that I personally fall into the protector warrior guy more than I am a right. hunter-gatherer hunter type, you know. Sure. Um, I mean, although I guess I do it, but not like what the way you guys do it, forget it, right, you know, right. mine is I'll go to jewel or I'll go to, you know, Walmart for you, you know, that kind of thing. Right. <laughs> but um, yeah. Uh, Cause I'm urban all the way. I'm like, Mr. Sure. Urban, you know, um, but yeah, yeah. You know, and it's, and it's a fascinating take on things. And, you know, uh, I have one, I, I'll call him a friend, recent, recent guy that I know from out here. Um, okay. I've only been living out here eight years, but you know, I, I, I have a different mindset than a lot of them on here, but you know, he's okay. It's actually, he's pretty good on that, but then he hits that one point and then he works himself up into a lather. And that's when I say, Hey, but Hey, it was nice talking to you. You know, we'll, we'll pick this up another time because sure. he just works himself up into, into a tizzy, you know, over his, his, his thinking. And, um, we will never agree. Right. right, <laughs> his, right certain things right because yeah i come from a more absolute fact fact based like forget the hyperbole forget the rumors forget the internet right, shit right. You know, what is reality um, <laughs> yeah yeah reality and is reality right so and i but anyway getting back to the, the thing it was a pleasure to see you or meet you this way uh, uh electronically uh and yeah i hope you can come back again too and the hunt for mike hanak continues um you know, maybe we can get him on one day too and, and have you with him because that'd be awesome. Um, we can do that with a zoom. That's what's good. You know, you can get people from all it over. Is. It is. I kind of like that, but um, yeah. And uh, again, I, I want to just send out my sympathies to Jason and his family and friends. And, and, you know, I'm glad to hear that since I'm not on Facebook, I don't post, but so Joe just, you know, post on my behalf. I mean, I texted him, but you know, post something for me, um, please. Joe Cardinal. And, uh, yeah, if there's, you know, Joe, Jason knows if there's anything he needs, I'm here, you know, uh, but, uh, yep, yeah, that's good. Joe, any closing Joe Cardinal first, any closing thoughts? Yeah, I think in closing, just thanks again, Joe Lau for making the time. And I said, it was, it was a great conversation, really, like I said, enlightening. It was great to revisit that. I had a great time meeting you back in the day. Um, and it's, I want to make sure we plug your stuff appropriately. The links. Yeah, Fire sure. Dojo, and that's for people who are listening. It's P H Y R E. -E. Dojo. 
Yeah, right. not yeah. So keep, pay attention to the spelling when you're looking up Fire Dojo. Um, I don't. I know you have a YouTube channel. Do you have a website as well? The website, so it's firedojo.com. Okay. The email is info at firedojo.com, and uh, for I have a YouTube channel, and it's just Fire Dojo. If you search Fire Dojo on YouTube, you'll it'll come up. I got a ton of video on there. A ton. It's all free. Well, we'll put the links too. Everybody. He'll write the links sure. out for you, for, for everybody sure. in the description page and stuff. And, uh, um, but you know, Joe normally misspells everything. So the way your dojo was already misspelled, he'll probably spell it the right way. F I R E yeah, going in. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's the way my brain well, works. <laughs> well, everybody, we'll see you uh, next week here on the podcast. Thanks for joining and. And uh, don't know if we're going to have a guest next week. You never know. I didn't know we were having this wonderful <laughs> guest today. So it turned out awesome. So everybody, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.